All right, um, everyone. So we'll start the lecture, uh, the registration now. Uh, okay. So before uh, we start the next registration, there is uh, a few announcements. Uh, if you don't have access to the hackathon room on Saturdays, like if your card does CMU card doesn't work on the elevators, please submit this poll. Mention your department name. I know it's an abbreviation. We got it from the roster, so even I don't know what all these names are but hopefully you know your own department's name, an abbreviation. So please fill this poll. I'll use this to get, get you access for the um, GSC sixth floor. And second, for virtual Andrew, I'm working with CMU IT. So I need more responses for both people who have a full five TB storage and people who don't have, only have like two GB. So we can probably figure out why it is so. And if for some reason, you don't see the CMU VLAB in your virtual Andrew at all, please provide that too. So uh, we can rectify this. Uh, virtual Andrew, because it has a good GPU and has good RAM uh, memory, so you can use it for your homeworks. But because of the storage issue, not every student is able to use it. So please fill these two forms, uh, polls latest by today so I can work with CMUIT and also to get you access to the hackathon room. So that's pretty much the announcement. I'll just give it to Sumesh. Can I, can you guys hear me? So good morning. So today we'll be looking into uh, face classification and verification, which we'll be mainly using in for your homework two part two. So I, I believe you guys might have encountered the task of classification. Where, so one of the common classification tasks are uh, Classifying whether your email is spam or not, you have. Uh, so if you if you ask, uh, if you if you are, if you have a company that sells a product, you need a lot of customers uh, reviews, and you need to segregate them if they want uh, positive or negative feedback. And uh, if you have a ton of them, then it's a tedious task. So you need a model that can do that. And in this case, in our homework. We'll be classifying an image based on who is in it. And uh, in daily use case, you are also using face ID verification. 
So that is more of a verification task. That's not a classification. We'll look that later. And one of the earliest uh, CNN cla uh, classifiers were for uh, classifying what a handwritten, uh, handwritten digit is. And I believe uh, you might have uh, encountered this in the lecture. Uh, so this is a more formal uh, explanation of what classification task is. It's a supervised learning method where a model tries to predict the label for a given input image. And uh, so there are various categories of classification. We have binary classification where there are just two labels. There's multi-class classification where you have more than two labels. And there is something also called as multi-label classification, which we are not doing, doing in this homework. So multi-label is basically like having uh, multiple classes in one uh, input instance itself. So before we hop on to uh, classification itself, let's just see uh, two problems, which are open set and closed set problems. So in closed set, uh, uh, we kind of give, uh, we have like k known classes in our training data sets. And we train the model on these k known classes. Uh, and when we are inferring the, uh, inferring the model, we give uh, the uh, test set comes from, uh, has k known classes only. It doesn't have anything apart from these. So say, say if I have like 10 known classes, it should belong to these 10 known classes, the test set. And in open set, when we are inferring, it's not necessary we need like k known classes. We can test it on uh, u unknown classes as well. So if we see how the model is behaving, so in closed set, the model kind, kind of uh, projects the input uh, image to a feature space. And here, we, uh, the model tries to bring a decision boundary on this features, uh, feature space. But in open set, we have tight decision boundaries. And uh, it's not necessary like it would divide, divide the feature space. There are some uh, space reserved for unknown data set as well. And this would become more of a metric learning problem. So here's a pictorial description of what is happening. So in closed set, we have something called as a label predictor, which is basically a model. It takes in an input image and gives the ID. And our training set has, say, like 10 celebrity images. And we have like 1,000 training sets for each celebrity, Im uh, uh, celebrity label. And when we, are in, uh, when, we, when we are inferring the model or testing the model, it's necessary that it should be like uh, from those 10 celebrity images which we trained on. 10 celebrity classes which we trained on. And when it comes to open set, we have something called a feature extractor. And it's also a model. But in this case, we are not getting the ID. We are getting a feature embedding or a feature vector. So for uh, each training class, we get a feature, uh, feature vector. And when we are introducing, uh, when we are testing, when we are introducing an unknown feature, uh, unknown uh, image, we get a feature. And we kind of compare it with the uh, training feature, feature vector which we get. So in order to like comprehend this more easily, we can compare the uh, closed set problem as a classification problem and an open set as a metric learning problem. So what I mean is here the feature uh, space is kind of like we give a decision boundary and that's all uh, it's done. Like we kind of separate it, separate the feature embeddings. But in case of uh, the closed set, uh, open set problem, we kind of uh, compare, uh, we have a comparison between the feature vectors or the feature uh, embeddings in, in, the, in this feature space. So we, uh, this is the flow chart which we'll be following for the uh, homework two part to classification part. Uh, so we give in an input image, the feature extraction model, which is basically a CNN uh, model. It kind of, uh, kind of gives, a, gives a feature embedding or the feature vector. And we have a classification linear layer, which is a multi-layer perceptron. 
it, uh, it takes in these feature embeddings and we give an output and the output dimension would be the number of classes. Uh, and from these number of classes, it's not necessary we would get the values between zero and one. We kind of need the probability distribution for which classes like uh, the Im image belongs to. So we use a softmax for that and uh, we would get a distribution between zero and one. And in our uh, homework, we would be encountering 7,001 classes. So uh, this is again like a visualization for the feature space. So what the feature embedding does is it kind of project, projects all the embeddings into a feature space. So all the position of these classifiers, uh, all the position of these images are done by the feature embedding. But the decision boundaries which we are getting here, the classifier is done by an MLP which we use, the linear classifying layer. So all the uh, DR classifier, uh, aeroplane classifier and uh, car classifier, those are all done by the multi-layer perceptron. And uh, you, uh, for the feature extraction, you can use mul uh, multiple, uh, you can use uh, models like efficient net, mobile net, exception, resnet, resnext, connect. I would highly encourage you to go through the papers associated with these models. Uh, they would really help you uh, in the classification task as well as in your uh, verification task. So just a recap, uh, I believe in the past two weeks you might have uh, I, uh, professor thought you uh, on convolution neural networks. So if we see the conventional convolution, we have say K filters, uh, M filters of the each filter being with a dimension K. We kind of convolve it on the input image and we get an output. And then um, uh, can anyone tell like what would be the, how would the dimension of the output dimension of your output like, what is the factor that is contributing to this? Yeah. The number of uh, that we have. Right. Exactly, yeah. So if I have, like, n, uh, n uh, kernels, that means I will have n channels of my output. And, uh, yeah, this is just a description of how the uh, convolution is happening and uh, so if we have to calculate the number of parameters so each uh, kernel has a dimension of k so we will have k square uh, parameters in each kernel and uh, if we are using m if our output size uh, output channel size should be like m then in that case we need like m kernels and uh, we, we, we have to convolve it to like n input channels. So we will have n into m into k square. I believe everyone understood that, right? Okay. And uh, you can uh, call the conventional convolution from Torch, uh, PyTorch, using the code given here. And uh, there is something called as depthwise separable convolution. It's it's similar to the conventional convolution. It's just uh, split up into two parts. We have something uh, so the con uh, depthwise separable convolution can be split up into two process: the filtering and the combining process. So uh, I'll just show you. So it kind of reduces uh, the number of parameters compared to the conventional convolution. So the first process is filtering. What we basically do is uh, we have a filter for each uh, input channel. We convolve it and we get the output is basically the same as uh, output uh, dimension, output channel will be similar to that of input channel. And uh, we, uh, we use, uh, so we, uh, if we have an M, uh, M uh, input channel, then the output of this filtering process would be M, M, uh, M channel as well. 
and uh, the next process which we are using is combining. So the fil filter which we use is denoted in orange color and uh, here basically we use one into one filter but we convolve it such that we, it goes through the depth. So that's why the, we call it depth-wise convolution. And uh, in this case, if we use uh, n, n different uh, such one into one convolutions, for uh, we would get n output channels. Does that make sense? We just give one, right? So if we if we convolve this one one at a time, mm -hmm. we would get the same uh, same uh, spatial dimension. It's just one into one, and for one filter, we would get just one uh, channel of this output. But if I use such uh, if I use like uh, n such yellow uh, orange uh, filters, then I would get like uh, n such channels. Did that answer? Yeah, so instead of having different kernels on the same, so I guess different kernels on the same channel, now you have like. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's just one. So in our conventional convolution, we use one filter. Yeah. We, uh, we kind of. Uh, use it along the channels as well, but the number of output channels would be determined like how many different, mm -hmm. uh, you know, three-dimensional channels I use. Yeah. And the total number of parameters, when we calculate this, the mk square, we get it from the uh, filtering process, and the n into m, uh, n into m parameters comes from the combining process. Is there any doubt regarding this calculation? So if I go back. Um, so M is the number of input channels here. And say consider the white kernel here, the first kernel. And it has a dimension of K into K. We have K square parameters in each kernel. And we use the kernel to convolve for each input channel. So the number of input channel here is M. So we have m into k square parameters here. And uh, in this case, we use one into one convolution. Uh, and that is like equal to the number of output channels which we need from the whole process. So say we need n output channels. And we have the depth. The depth here is actually uh, m, m output from the previous uh, process which was filtering. So we have m, uh, m as the dimension for d, and uh, m in one kernel. And we, for, for getting it, for, uh, for getting n output channels, we use n such yellow channels, so n into m. All right. So if we compare the number of parameters which we are using in depth-wise and the conventional uh, convolution. Uh, I believe uh, everyone knows how to calculate the number of uh, parameters in a conventional con convolution, right? Right? So if I use regular convolution here, uh, this, this is my uh, filter size. And uh, three de just denotes the number of chan input channels here. And uh, say this is my uh, this is my spatial dimension here, and this is the output channels I need. Uh, in regular convolution, you you have like around one million one million parameters, but in 
in depth wise convolution we would just have like uh, 50,000. So this is very effective uh, in terms of computation, uh, but it's very hard to train such networks because processing such information through very less parameters is a difficult task fairly. Uh, so one good thing is these are used in uh, uh, networks like uh, efficient net and mobile net. Uh, it's like it takes up very less computation and gives you fairly good results, but the training is a bit difficult here. And uh, you, uh, to get uh, to have a smoother, a bed, uh, stable, stable training, you can use uh, uh, methods like uh, batch normalization, where normalization happens for every single mini batch of your input uh, input. Uh, input data to your model and in layer normalization you normalize it through every uh, channel of your in, uh, input. So in case of batch normalization it, it's not necessary you need to use a dropout. You can still use a dropout but uh, it kind of acts like a regularizer in this case. and one bad thing about layer normalization is like how much computation time in terms of computation time is you require the same computation for training as well as training uh, training and as well as testing because the uh, layer normalization hap uh, doesn't take the running uh, average of your mean and your uh, variance in case of so in batch normalization we just take the running average of your mean and your variance but in layer normalization, you can't do that. It happens for every in input instance. Did that come in? Did that work? You seem a bit doubtful. So, like, what would be a use case of normalization? When would you use this, I guess? Or what would be? You can use it anytime, but okay. uh, I'm just explaining, like, what are the Disadvantages of using layer no matter. Yeah. Uh, so it 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 kind if your training data set is not like generalized. Uh, in that case, it, batch norm is highly dependent on the running mean and your variance. So it, initially, it's calculated on your training, and you can't calculate the running uh, mean and your variance during your testing. And in that case, if you if you're not uh, if your training data set is not that reliable, in that case you can use layer norm. You it would just normalize against all the kinds of your norm. Yes. So in this homework, you will definitely encounter overfitting. Uh, I mean, it's the hard truth hard truth here. So there are certain techniques where you can, uh, which you can use. So there's something called as label smoothing. So in order to tackle overfitting and overconfidence, overfitting is basically when your training accuracy is like uh, very low compared to your validation accuracy. It's kind of like getting accustomed to your training data set, but not generalizing much. And uh, overconfidence is like, it's like predict the prediction for your sake if I have 20 different classes and uh, the class output for, uh, so if my class four prediction is like 99%, it has a confidence score of 99%. The model is kind of overconfident there. You don't want that. Uh, it might not generalize, uh, it, it, it is not generalized in that case. It might like be accustomed to only particular kind of data. So in that case, what you would do is, uh, you bring down the accuracy of the class, say class four has a confidence score of 99, you kind of bring it down to 94 and distribute it to other classes as well. If I have to explain. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, so usually I have a probability distribution for each of my 20 classes. 
it's not necessary i uh, if it's even right for a, if i if my prediction is class 4 I don't want it to be one at one uh, at class four, the probability value for class four. So in that case, what I would do is like, I would make it like around uh, 90% as my confidence score for class four and give the rest 10% to other classes. So it kind of smoothens the probability distribution for this class. How do you know like how much to keep it back? And how much to uh, that's kind of a hyperparameter which you need to play with. So usually we calculate it using a smoothing factor called alpha. So it ranges between zero to one. So it kind of determines how much uh, you need to take it from your maximum value, like take down the maximum value and distribute it. And yeah. So if you see the soft max value without smoothing, it comes out to be 0 0.999 and rest all zero. But if you use label smoothing, you kind of decrease the high, high confidence of high score uh, and kind of distribute it to other classes as well. So you use it both during training and scripts, if it has the uh, I mean, while training, you, you would definitely do this. But uh, in testing, I don't think you need label smoothing. I mean, uh, that's the output we, which you get from your soft, soft max. Okay, that's part of the Yeah. Output. Uh, it's not necessary you need it for your inference. So another regularization technique is called drop block. I mean, I believe everyone has encountered uh, dropouts in your homework one. So we... Uh, so dropout 2D, uh, if you use dropout 2D, there is one drawback. So it kind of like, eliminate, uh, it's kind of random and it eliminates the spatial correlation between two uh, pixels. So if I have an eye here, and if, I ha uh, if there is some correlation between the neighboring pixel, and if I remove that, the model might not learn, okay, there, there is an eye here and this is supposed to be an animal here. So it kind of, it's kind of like a drawback for drop dropout 2D. So in that case, we would use something called a drop out, drop log, wherein we uh, we remove the whole neighbors neighboring pixels. It's kind of uh, I would say instead of like randomizing, you you kind of get the contiguous regions to be uh, removed, and you kind of make the model adapt to even like small features you, which you get. And uh, I believe uh, you guys might have encountered the problem of vanishing gradients in homework one, wherein your uh, initial layers might not be updated using batch normalization, uh, using your gradient descent and back propagation. Uh, in that case, you can use something called a residual network uh, most of the convolution neural network which you will be using in this homework will use a residual, a residual network. So basically, you kind of give a skip connection uh, from your input data. In this case, you'll have two. Uh, so during ba back propagation, you'll encounter two uh, gradients, one from your uh, one which you calculate normally in your back propagation, and another you calculate it through the identity function, and that would also, uh, so instead of like, a, as you go through the layer, your, your gradient through your layer would decrease, and there won't be much back, uh, back propagation there. But if I use the gradient from the I, uh, x function, the identity function, there would be some magnitude in your gradient, and back prop propagation will happen. So this will help you. Uh, uh, mitigate the issue of uh, vanishing gradients. And uh, so this is an overview of homework to part two. You have an objective where you have to solve an image-based phase classification problem using CNN. And uh, you should, uh, you, you are given a scenario where recognizing and verifying faces in images. And uh, 
CNNs are usually positional invariant, and the pictures of fa faces have uh, indeterminacy. And uh, the first part will require you to solve the closed set problem, which is basically classification, and then an open set, open set problem where uh, we'll be encountering verification. And uh, basically, the class uh, the initial CNN layer, yeah. Slide. Okay. Yeah, usually, in, uh, so if I use a convolution after like, so if I have two weight layers, basically there are two convolutions there. It kind of decreases my spatial dimension. Yeah, yeah. But in the skip con connection, the spatial di dimension might not be the same. So in that case, we'll use a convolution there as well to match the spatial dimension. So instead of the identity function there, you'll use a convolution. One convolution that can like get get you there okay. yeah. so you will you, usually you will have like eight layers of convolution and then in the skip connection you would use one convolution that could give you the spatial dimension of eight dimension uh, eight convolutions and then the gradient of that is larger than just using all of those yes usually that's the case Uh, I believe in bonus of this homework too, you will encounter ResNet. So you can use that if you want to like understand how the ResNet works. So yeah, you will be implementing uh, two models. One is the feature extractor, which is CNN based model. And one is a classifying layer, which is just a multi-layer perceptron. So, Feature extractor, as I explained before, just gives a feature embedding of feature vector. This feature vector you will later use in verification. Uh, we'll come come to that later. For classification, we use those fe feature like uh, feature vector and give it to the cla uh, classifying layer just to get those seven thousand one classes. Like, what is the probability for those classes? So. Yeah, I would highly encourage go through some papers regarding ResNet, ResNext, ConNext, uh, whatever is suggested in the uh, slides. And then uh, secondly, yeah, we will use cross entropy laws for this one because it's a classification task here. And when it comes to, uh, when we see the data set, we'll be using a subset of VGG phase two you don't need to create a completely different data set for this. Uh, you can just load it from uh, the image folder. And uh, make sure uh, you guys use augmentations within the uh, a data set class. So it, uh, the model would kind of adapt to different scenarios of your data and it can more uh, generalize. Uh, all these things I explained before, you can go through the slides later. Yeah. Um, I believe, do we have anything else? Questions? So I was saying, um, for the, they mentioned some custom or like different losses that we might use. Yeah. Um, it seems like for some of the, like the triplet loss, the data loader might have to be changed to load like three, the like the um, image 
itself and then like positive examples, negative examples. Do you guys have any guidance on that or is that going to be gone over? Uh, we'll go through the verification first and then oh, we'll okay. come to that. Yeah. Anything about the classification part for now? So before I go to verification, I would like to know, like, did everyone understand what classification is, how to do it, and why we do it? Um, okay, what's the point of convolutions to begin with? Why do we use convolutions? I don't understand patterns that could be taken in any for many reasons. You want to find patterns that are related to the position. Okay. But so, yeah, go ahead. So the fact that this two minutes here is future from the future, that is from like, that's a differential from two differential from one. Okay, so the reason I'm, I'm taking this approach is because so you know uh, beyond this homework how to use conditions and in which problems you can use them. Conditions not necessarily have to be used only for uh, vision. And yeah. Uh, is it better now? Should be. Uh, people on Zoom, can you confirm if I'm audible? Yeah, people say yes. Yeah, that's good. Uh, also, uh, feel free to unmute yourself on, on Zoom and uh, I mean, speak directly in the class. Um, and obviously, just mute back once you're done. You can press the spacebar key on your laptop. That way you can just speak, uh, unmute while you're speaking. So yeah, uh, what's the point of convolutions? And like you said, uh, we, want, we might want scenarios where we want positional invariance, right? Can we not implement positional invariance in linear layers? You'd have to learn probably like many, many new parameters. Um, but you'd have to have a data set that first of all covers all of those invariances. And then you'd have to make it like kind of distribution or you can add data augmentation to add noise to make things positional invariance right just like you're doing for rotation like uh, conditions are not rotational invariance but we add a rotational element just so that our model learns rotational invariance correct so and you mentioned about distributive features okay that's also a good thing but can't you find distributive features using linear layers Much more inputs, right? Yeah. Have a much larger. Or use augmentation. So what other So what exactly is different about convolutions? What exactly is the uh, is the biggest like plus point? What is the advantage? Or rather, think about where is the advantage of convolution coming from? What is different in convolutions versus linear layers that convolution is getting you these advantages? What is the primary difference? So we are sharing parameters. If you were using a linear layer, we'll have one uh, parameter, one weight element for every uh, dimension of the input, right? And each of those weights will be independent variables. But because we are using shared weights in a kernel, the kernel weights are shared across different uh, points in the input dimension. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. So I think like, we're doing the same thing as Yes, so there are ways, there, I mean, in the lecture and also in homework part one, you would have seen how to convert a CNN into an MLP, right? So yes, you can do the same things with MLP also. Um, so you could have done that in homework one, part two also, but ideally we prefer you not to use the convolution side of things. But yes, you can implement a convolution using an MLP, using shared weights concept. Um, okay, so now do you understand why we use convolutions, right? So any place where we want shared weights will work, whether it's vision or speech or text or whatever. It doesn't matter what modality it is. If the concept of shared weights can work for us, we can use convolutions here. Everyone agrees? And you have access to Google search, you have access to chat GPT and whatever. 
So if I say something wrong, you're supposed to correct me. All right? Okay, uh, next thing. What's the point of point-wise convolution, depth-wise convolution? That was the question I asked, right? So in depth-wise convolution, what is the size of the depth? In the depth-wise convolution kernel, what is the size of depth? Okay, check again. There's, you also have access to the bootcamp slide. So in depth-wise convolutions, what will be the size of the depth dimension of the kernel? Okay, so what will be the size of the other kernel dimension, height and width? Again, what's the point of depth wise convolution? Why, why, why even bring it in the picture? Again, same parameters. How are we saving on parameters? So in depth wise convolutions, we are saving parameters by having depth of kernel as one. So in a normal convolution, in a normal convolution, the kernel will be a three-dimensional thing. It will have some height, some width, some depth, correct? But in depth-wise convolution, okay. um, I don't know. In one of the earlier sets, you can check. So the depth-wise convolution, you have depth as a single uh, dimension, and you have a certain height and width. Am I correct? Or am I wrong? Yes, this place. What is the dimension of the depth? One. What about point wise convolution? Again, you are trying to reduce the number of parameters. What is the dimension of height and width for point wise convolution? One. So in point wise convolution, you have one cross one height and width, and you have the depth equal to. What is the depth of point wise convolution kernel? When you say depth, you mean like. Um, what are the, how many, yeah, the number of channels in the kernel of a point wise convolution? Would it be the same as the other channels? Yes. So now, does it make sense what's the point of point wise convolution and depth wise convolution and regular convolution? It's all to reduce the number of parameters we have. And, by, and we reduce the number of parameters by sharing weights across certain dimensions. Yeah. So is that in one combination? Like the width and the height of the filter is one? Yes. Would that be? Yeah, that would probably correct. Good point. So everyone was sleeping in the class and you were doing the presentation first. Now people are waking up. And then. If we did normal convolution, our height, width, and depth would all be non. Not yeah, it would be more than one. It would be like in that picture, it'd be every single hole. Like, say it's going this direction. And if we did depth wise, it would be the like box the square is everything. So yes, uh, so, if, uh, so again, in depth wise, you, your number of channels in the kernel is one. So you're sharing uh, weights across the depth dimension. And in point wise, you're sharing weights across the pixel dimension, the height and width. Um, quick question, so in a normal convolution uh, network, you have the output channels as the number of pixels, right? Um, so in a depth wise, have just one like, bigger filter or like one effective filter that would just get it broadcasted. So you have to check that. That how is how are you broadcasting it? Or how do you implement a depth wise convolution? Okay. Alright? Yes. Why might we prefer like standard versus point wise versus depth wise? Right? Just to reduce the number of parameters. So we are sharing weights to reduce the parameters and then we test it out. Is it working for us or not? So to see in which scenarios point-wise might work, 
software in which scenarios you can actually share weights and have only single pixel for the kernel, and in which scenarios you can have only a single shadow for the kernel and share it across ten. But it's not expected that point wise or depth wise will be any better than the standard. I'll leave that question open to you. You have chat GPT, you have Google search. So there are, there are papers. So no, it's just like worse, it's just the trade off that like there's less expressivity. So it depends again. Um, like, so like people do these things empirically first, they see if something is working. Then later on, people try to build theory for it, why it is working. So there will be papers which will give an empirical result for these three kind of conditions. And then you can look at, and it will all probably be in imaginary data set. And then you can find why that researcher thinks it's working. All right, so we know the conditions now, at least, right? Now the problem was phase classification and phase verification. So before we go to phase classification and verification, let's talk about the set. Is this clear, closed set and open set? So is closed set always classification? Can open set be a classification problem or can closed set be a verification problem? So before that, let's see. So we, uh, we give you a closed set classification problem in our homework. Is there an actual real world use case for it? Beyond the homework, would you actually ever have to have a closed set classification problem in some business or some, some problem? Probably. What could be a use case? If you have like a fixed number, like a known fixed number out of possibility, if something can never change, then it might work. But if it's some like area where you have a matrix that maybe one or two. Okay, so assume you did homework too well and you understand how to do classification for a fixed number of sets, a closed set. How can you apply it? How, like you want to build a startup, you want to look for a problem for this solution. What would that problem be? And what if I come in? Then I have to update my model. No, I'm saying not as an employee, as a as a someone as an intruder. If I come in. Oh yeah, if you if you are plugging the place and maybe like actually. So is it a closed set? But this is a closed set for my like interaction. I mean you're you're making an authentication system to keep people out also, right? It matters if like you think that it's the process that it's actually happening. Like that that I don't know about classification, but maybe like a ranking problem would be more if you want to ra like rank only your top five or top ten engineers. You only care about five. I guess that could be more than like the whole set, but you have to kind of augment your interaction. Okay, so the, the dif primary difference between closed set and open set problem is the number of classes in your training and the number of classes you see in inference are same or not. If the model sees both as the same number of classes, then it's a closed set problem. If it's an inference, you might see a new class, that makes it an open set, set problem, correct? So where you think you can apply a closed set classification? Because you're good with projects, right? So you look for projects where you already know how to solve something. What was homework one, part two? What were you classifying? Phonemes. Yeah. So are phonemes a closed set or an open set? Closed set. So if you're only working with the English language, you have a closed set, right? Is that a real world problem? Probably not. Why not? Um, because there's like this probably won't even account for changes in accents, let alone in different languages. Yeah. So accent. So if you move to a different language, you have a different phoneme set. That will make it an open set problem. And then there is something called IPA which has the phonetics across a large number of languages. And you can look into if it's closed or open. But if you're, if you're making a speech recognizer for English language, even with accents, you can have a closed set of phonemes. And in homework three, yes, sir. Or different types, and you have to classify for each class. Where, where, so, so 
the yoga teacher and you know take a step. So you can still make it a closed set. The, the thing that I was trying to, hoping you'd answer when I said the intuitive side of things, is you can always have none of the above. You have 10 classes, and you have another class called none of the above. Right? Does that make sense? OK. So that's classification. What about verification? What is the use case for verification? Why do we study, why do we do face verification, for example? Can we use it somewhere? Yeah, like I think the first use case that comes to mind is just checking if, um, like, the face matches with some kind of record. If, for example, the agency pays an employee, mm -hmm. and, like the employee verifies his face value or like face recognition or something like that. Okay, I'll come to that part. Yeah. Uh, verification is like classification, but you just don't have enough. Data to do just the verification part. Okay. Which is why we have the first few classifications for like the two cases we did. Okay, so yeah, I'll, yeah, so we'll, we'll come to the, the side of verification. My initial question was what's the use case for verification? Why do we need verification? And you said face recognition. If you have like a Windows Hello or a face recognition on your iPhone, and let's say you're an engineer who's designing it. What would you train your model upon? Can you have enough pictures of your end users to train that? Do you know who would be your end user B? You have to work with the in-shot thing, basically. Yeah. So you, like when you when you set it up on your phone, you probably take a snapshot of your user's picture. Yes. I mean, likely only one. Yeah. Maybe different time periods. So you need uh, like a few shot thing that to probably just in one go, and your model should be able to recognize the user. And if you look at face check. In let's say 2018 or 17, you'll see that news coming in that uh, a son is able to log into a mother's iPhone. So it can also fail. So you need to have some tolerances. But the whole point is, you need to train a classifier to recognize facial features, not a face as such, and then hope that with few shot learning, with one or few shots, you can customize it for any user who would be buying your iPhone or buying your laptop. Does that make sense? Any question on this? All right. Um, same thing is again. It might work for surveillance also. So if you have you have CCTV cameras everywhere, you don't really know the number of people who are going through that area. But let's say if you have CCTV camera spread across a city, you can still track one specific individual across an entire movement through a city, right? For that, you don't know who that person is, but if you can find a signature of this person's face, and you can track that signature across different camera feeds, that's, again, an open set problem. OK, now uh, I'll just move to the data set part of it in the starter code. In homework one, we ask you to create a data set class. In homework two, did you create a data set class? Why not? We used, I think, the image. Okay. Created it out of the class. And how did that? Okay. So, so the. Uh, so what were there labels in the data set in the training data set? Folder. Yeah, the folder and the file name was in, named in a way that you can find the labels, right? Uh, what about test data set? Did you create a test class for test or no? Yeah. It's similar, right? So why do we have to create a data set class for test? Why not? Do the same thing. Because you don't want to. Oh. So, why could you not use the same uh, image folder default class for test data set? You don't want to load the label. Like, even though we have a label text in data set, do you have it? It's not just offered up anyway. We could, sorry, we don't. Yeah, so it's in a test data set. I mean, it will give garbage labels. It still have a file name, right? So it will give a garbage label, and you can ignore the label. So why can't you use image folder class for loading the test data set? Or let's say if I force you that you can't use your own custom implementation, you have to use 
Python standard implementation. Can we use it as folder for loading test data? Yeah. So this compares in my folder. If it might make the problem in open set problems where you're taking pictures of people that you know that you have brain down, it would make sure that it will only last time as a first uh, problem you get in this way. So for the test data set, we can simply, even if the file has some random name, we can ignore that label as a garbage, right? So that still keeps it closed set. We just don't know the label of this test data. Uh, like for example, in validation, when, you, when you're testing a validation, uh, when you're doing an inference, you don't really care about the label, right? You're only comparing the, the inference of validation data with the actual ground truth to see how mod your model is performing. Similarly, when you're doing testing, you can again ignore the labels. But why don't you do that? And also, can you do that? The comment says you can, but can you? I mean, I guess you could get it to work, but it would kind of be not ideal because in an ideal setting, you shouldn't see, you shouldn't have labels for things like this. So, I mean, uh, somewhat I'll agree. So yes, uh, with some tweaks, you can actually use in this folder, but I mean, we can figure it out how to do that. And that same question goes to your verification data set class. So if you are using something like a contrastive line loss, which requires you to have for every uh, sample, a positive and a negative correlation, or something like that, see if you have available data set cl uh, classes in Python. If not, uh, writing your own would be easier than tweaking something which exists. So that's like an open problem for you. Figure out what you can use. All right. Now, so lo the contested losses were covered in detail in the boot camp by Gene. So I would not go into that. Uh, my, my question would be more simpler first. So you have this classification, uh, not this, sorry. I switched to a wrong classification. You have this classification pipeline, correct? Now, how do you do verification on this pipeline? What do you? Where do you disconnect this pipeline and start verification? Okay, so what is the sequence building state? How does it look like? Where in your code is sequence building state? It's just before the test, like either the flattening or the linear layer that you have at the end. So I would say that's an easy answer because we told you that there's a linear layer here. So anything before that might have feature embedding, correct? But what does feature embedding look like? Or what is feature embedding? Go ahead. Also, people on Zoom, feel free to unmute and answer. Uh, I was just going to say that it's like a, um, because you're taking it just after all the computation of the discovery phase, it would be like a compressed Okay, so is feature embedding a real thing, or we just use a name for whatever is the end of the condition? No, in general, feature embedding phase is kind of like a compressed dimensional representation of the training data set in the end, right? Or the data that you're trying to model. I mean, if you put something through convolutions, it will get compressed, right? But is that a, is that a real thing? Like, for example, if I ask you, uh, what's the point of feature embedding? Or how does a feature embedding look like? How can you visualize feature embedding? In, in an ideal world, it should kind of learn this like similarities between similar data and kind of distribute it in that embedding space, which is some kind of number of dimensions, such that you can kind of group similar things together. Okay, so if I'm if my data, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean it's like it's. I think we're just calling the word very hard to visualize, but like you could imagine if you were that it's like how wide is your base, how tall is your base, and you can place faces within that. That that would be a feature. So, um, okay, because if you have, we are working with face, so are the feature embeddings, are eyes, nose, ears, et cetera, or are these like the dimension of the face, the way that you mentioned, or are they something like skin color, et cetera? So uh, one is how can we tell 
what feature embeddings is about in learning, because we are we create it for one thing and we use, using it for a completely different thing, right? And when we cut out these linear classification layer, we don't have those 7,000 classes that we want in the beginning, am I correct? If we don't have those classes, we should still know if this pipeline will work for verification or not. I mean, obviously, the standard code tells you to do that, so you can do that. It might work, it might also not work. We tell you you can use contrasted logic. Again, it might work, it might not. So how do you, uh, if it's not working, how do you tell if you got the right feature embeddings for your problem or not? So, yeah, so that's like, you have an end result in terms of you have a classification ac accuracy for yourself. Yeah. And if you go through the process, you have some verification accuracy also. But you got stuck, you can't cross the high cutoff. So how do you tell if you have to focus more on classification work and make a better classifier, or you should focus more on the verification side and make a better verifier? How do you decide that? You need some intermediate checkpoints to tell you that this thing is working well, and this thing is what you need to do more. Yeah, go ahead. I don't know. Is there like a way to check the similarities within feature embeddings? Like if you maybe have like similar embeddings, maybe there's something wrong. Yeah, but how would you tell if images have similar embeddings? Like using because a similarity metric or something? Yeah, so that's give, the similarity metric is giving us a finite verification score. That's already out there. And if that's not giving us the right answer, what, what do we look into our model architecture and pipeline to figure out where should we focus our efforts? So the answer is coming from the similarity matrix, right? And if that answer is not good enough for your use case, what do you do next? You kind of add, um, you give augment the verification to take embeddings that are before the feature embedding feature to feature embedding. So, before, so to come to that point, we need to understand what feature embedding is, and most importantly, how do you visualize it so that we can have some idea uh, of Yes, yeah, so because the weights will update based upon your classification, yeah. things will change for verification also. But will they change for good or bad? And when I say you have to visualize feature embedding, for example, uh, did anyone try uh, ensembling things for homework one? But you do know what, how ensemble works, right? So can you ensemble feature embeddings of two different models? And if yes, in what way? Can you just add the output of all these different models, last function layer? That's why I said we need to. Yeah. Basis, right? Sorry? Out there in different spaces, like different models. Yes, yeah, so they're in different spaces. Can we do uh, ensemble for verification at all? I don't think so. But... So, yes, I'll leave this as an open question that what feature embedding is. Use, again, yeah, good. Should be able to. Use an ensemble for verification and compare the two feature embeddings because they can be different from each other of how they represent the input to the other. Okay, so then at what stage can we do an ensemble? If not at feature embedding space, what is next? Next, so okay, in verification, because everyone has done the early cutoff, what comes after feature embedding in verification? What is the next step? Look at your code. What did it do after you got yeah? The similarity metric. Yeah. So you have very, you have feature embeddings and then you have the similarity matrix count. So do you do ensemble before similarity matrix or after similarity matrix? You only have two choices. Then after that, maybe like the assumption that. Similarity, you kind of assume that it's distributed radially, but maybe the feature embedding space is not distributed radially. Maybe it's like the Euclidean distance will be more meaningful in terms of the 
they can. But again, the question comes, uh, like he said, are they in different hyperdimensions? And then adding them, would that even make sense or not? And when you're creating a cosine angle, is that angle, adding that angle, does that make sense or not? So you have to figure that part out. And this is, I would su suggest something like in machine learning, deep learning in general, you see a lot of jargon in papers and presentation and stuff. You should always try to understand what that word actually means in practice. Because or else people just say some, some big word and move on. And it may or may not even be a real thing. Okay? So because we are close to the end of our recitation, I would say try to try to figure out what fish embedding is. It's, it's a very uh, common term. So you will find enough papers on this term. Uh, and try to figure out how you can visualize it. And will the visualization look more like has anyone done like uh, look into the the dream thing, the deep dream, uh, where you visualize what a convolution actually learns and you create these extra hallucinations? So try to figure out if that is the kind of visualization that will work for future embedding for you, or the visualization will look more like I don't know the clustering thing, like points in a space. So figure out different. There, there might be different techniques of visualizing it. You have to figure out what would work for you, and by, by work means what tells you what to do next in your model. So every, you, you visualize things to help you understand what should be the next strategy to improve your verification score or improve your classification score. All right? And also, like we just told you that you can disconnect between the last CNN and the first linear layer, correct? Can you disconnect before that? How would things change if you disconnect a few layers before that? And this will become important if you, you know, your number of parameters cross the 20 million, it becomes 21 million. Can you disconnect before that and add a linear layer there? Will that work? So feature embedding. Yeah. Just like earlier in the So where does a feature embedding actually becomes useful? Is something you have to figure out. And for that, you have to visualize it probably, right? So there are 10 condition layers. And after the eighth layer, you're crossing the parameter limit. Can you add a linear layer after eighth layer itself? And fine tune it. So to, to figure out this out, that at what layer you finally have a useful feature embedding, you need to figure out what, what embedding is in the first place and how to visualize it. All right? Okay. So what do I have to say? Um, I had a question sure. about the fine tuning. There's just a general question. So if you have a model of like a certain size, then you want to shrink it and fine tune it on the existing third layers. Is there a way to do that? Because you'd have to like create a new model essentially, and quote unquote the weights may not be straightforward. Right? So you have to like manually go through all the weights and compute it and fine tune it. Or you can first load the model and then change the class. Like just like we did ResNet, you have skip connections, right? Just like we did ResNet, you have a skip connection. And then if you want to cut things from before, you can add a skip connection there. That will not change the weights, but certain weights will become, will become useful. So I mean to say like, so in general, like when you do this kind of pre-training and fine tuning, um, usually you make it bigger, like you add another layer, and so it's easy to just port the weights and then wrap it around the new layer so that you can fine tune it. Change. But the verification will require you to make it smaller. Yeah. So like. Is there a way, like using PyTorch or so, to kind of take a bigger model, save the checkpoints, save the weights, but then use those weights in a smaller model? Because you have to like read through all of the weights. And yes, you can do that, but looping would not be a good solution. So what I'm trying to say is, so okay, first understand what exactly is in the checkpoint. The checkpoint has a dictionary of weights, right? Uh, so uh, as long as you don't change the number of weights, you can still load the checkpoint in one step. So you add a skip connection. For example, um, you can in your code you can add this like an if then else statement, where if you are doing verification, where is the if you are doing verification, your output is coming after here, not one of the. So the number of parameters necessarily won't change. It's just what you're using will change. Yes. Okay. Uh, the output comes in classification. Where is the output coming from? Is it here, here, or here? So, so after that, 
Did you implement softmax in your architecture? Uh, usually, no, actually, because your loss function you probably have, like, yes. it does the logging. So the cross entropy loss in PyTorch is implemented along with softmax. Hence, we do not have softmax at the last of our modern architecture. But if you're using a different loss function for some, some other purpose, make sure either it has softmax or you are using softmax on your purpose. So our output is coming currently from here. And we have an if statement which can let us output from here also. The same thing can be done from the in between all these things. So as long as you don't change the weights of the model, by changing weights, like as long as uh, the like you don't so when you're loading the dictionary, there should be some key against which you'll add a value. So as long as those keys exist, there can be more keys, but as long as those keys exist, you can still load the dictionary very easily. Yes. But then if you have like So you have to prove in your code that the number of parameters that you are actually using for inference are within the parameter limit, yeah. which means you may not be able to use dot summary. And that's the reason in slides we teach you how to calculate the parameters that you're using. So do that, figure out the number of parameters. There's a small code that you can write yourself and show us in your code itself that the number of parameters are still less than 20 million. Any other question? All right, then, uh, if you are working on the verifi uh, the feature embedding part of things, uh, we have a hackathon tomorrow. It's three hours. I even have an office hour after that, so it's four hours plus that uh, You can work it in the hackathon. I will not tell you the answer, but I can still point you in a certain direction, which may or may not be the right direction. All right, thank you.